And we're going to move on now to our uh, landing and launching pads uh, panel. Uh, we have two speakers, Michelle Monk and Kathy Larini. Uh, we will have them each speak. Um, and then at the end of, of their talks, we will have 10 minutes for Q&A. So as, as the talks are going, please write your questions in the Q&A and, um, and we'll, we'll get to them in, during the Q&A session after their talks. So now I'm going to introduce Michelle Monk. Um, she, uh, she has a bachelor's of aerospace, aeronautical and astronautical engineering from Virginia Tech. She has worked with, in NASA for over 30 years and has been a key person in the entry, descent, and landing for multiple programs. She has served as deputy project manager and pressure subsystem lead for the Mars Science Laboratory, MSL, entry, descent, and landing, EDL, instrumentation, so that's medley suite. Uh, and she's also served um, as, as the STMD principal technologist. Um, and and she, she's now PI for one of the, the commercial lunar payload uh, services program missions, CLIPS missions. Uh, and the name of that is SCALPS. Uh, Michelle, go ahead. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks very much. much. Just, Just do a, a quick, quick audio, audio check. check. We're getting a little bit of an echo on your line, Michelle. Okay. How about, How about that? that? I'm afraid we're still getting that echo. Um, is it possible for you to maybe try unplugging your headset? How's that? Is that better? Could you try? Yeah, that's much better. Thank you. Okay. All right. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, let's uh, go to the next slide. Um, so I'm going to be talking uh, about the plume surface interaction activities that we have going on uh, currently within NASA and how those um, play into uh, excavation and construction, in particular landing pad uh, requirements and um, fabrication. So uh, I think we all know that lunar landing plumes are a significant source of dust on the surface and, um, you know, it's going to be a significant obstacle to getting a sustainable human presence and these landing and ascent um, events are going to spread dust everywhere. And um, we know that these will um, impact uh, the dust mitigation strategies, um, the lunar surface operations, um, and the damage uh, that we might see to other assets that are around uh, the landing and ascent areas. Um, we are uh, actively trying to um, advance our modeling capabilities in this area. And in order to do that, we want to um, understand the ejecta and how it behaves um, as a result of the plumes from the uh, landing vehicles. We want to understand the surface erosion and um, the risks that that might pose to the landers themselves, um, as well as the lander environment. Um, how uh, is the, the heating and pressure and ejecta affecting the base of the vehicle and its legs or other systems. Um, we have seen, you know, from the past that uh, we have little data from Apollo. There weren't really any dedicated uh, PSI um, instruments or observations. What we know is from the video um, that it looks out of the crew cabin. Um, so we've made, uh, there have been historical observations and analysis of that, um, uh, most notably by Phil Metzger um, and his team throughout the years. Uh, we did have um, the Surveyor 3 uh, material that was kind of sandblasted from a Apollo landing event and then brought back to the Earth for analysis. But really the direct observation of this phenomenon has been very limited. Next slide. 
So uh, and within NASA, um, we recognized that this would be a challenge area. We were actually starting to embark on this um, advancing the state of the art for uh, Mars landings for uh, preparing for humans on Mars. And uh, then we, the Artemis program was born and we were looking at the moon. So uh, we have started a multi-year investment within Space Technology Mission Directorate to um, advance the tools and um, really get a handle on uh, all the phenomenon that will be created by the landing events. Um, this project is led by Marshall Space Flight Center with uh, many other partners throughout NASA and in academia. Um, you'll see the list there. Uh, our customers are, um, you know, pr primarily um, human exploration and operations uh, and the sustainability um, on the lunar surface. Uh, but these tools and um, capabilities, you know, can be used by commercial entities, international partners and coordination bodies and science missions as well. So we have kind of a three-pronged approach to um, advance our predictive simulation capability, to conduct ground tests and get validation data for, um, you know, making sure those tools are uh, making the correct predictions, and also developing flight instrumentation. Um, flying on clips is not an integral part of this particular project, but it's part of the, the body of work that we're trying to do as a community. Next slide. Um, so for the predictive simulation capability, that number one item, we kind of have four tasks that we're pursuing, um, understanding the plume, uh, particularly in low pressure environments like the vacuum of the moon or the low density at Mars, um, and how that plume expands um, and how it's going to impinge on the surface. Um, the second task is to really look at um, how the uh, that flow um, reacts with the surface and creates craters, uh, how they develop and how um, the ejecta sheets form. Um, the third part is really to get down into the details, um, as we just heard of the uh, soil or uh, the regolith that we're impinging upon. And you saw that those are very complex shapes um, that we need to deal with in our models and, um, and understand. And then the fourth uh, part of that, really kind of putting all that together, is the interaction um, between the gases um, near the surface and how uh, and, and the regolith particles themselves. So this is where we, you know, can then make reliable predictions about um, the particle sizes, um, their trajectories, their velocities, and the energy uh, at which they're hitting uh, other assets in the area. Next slide. Um, I'll mention that we're, uh, you know, fortuitously, <laughs> we are able to um, do some flight instrumentation in parallel with the project I just described. And so um, you heard that I'm involved with uh, something called scalps. We actually have two uh, scalps payloads um, manifested for uh, CLIPS lander flights. The first one will be on the Intuitive Machines lander in uh, February of 22. And um, we have four cameras that uh, look in stereo at the crater that's formed underneath the lander so that we can get a very good um, stereo image and reconstruct the digital elevation map of the surface topography of that crater um, after landing. Um, it's There's some error in that because we don't quite know what the pre-landing topography looked like. So we have a second chance to fly scalps on uh, the Firefly Blue Ghost Lander um, in 2023. And as part of that, we're trying to understand when uh, we're, we're adding long focal -like length uh, lenses and cameras to that uh, mission to understand the pre-landing topography and get a good um, initial uh, stereo image of the surface um, before it starts being affected by the lander plumes. And so we're working closely with the computational modelers at Marshall Space Flight Center um, to see how the uh, surface will be affected as the lander altitude changes. So on the, along the top of this uh, chart, you see 
uh, 20 meters, six, 10 meters, two and a half, and then zero, which is landing, and how the, um, the uh, effect on the surface changes as our uh, lander changes altitude. So we're trying to understand this to make sure we can capture an image of the surface before um, the plume affects uh, the surface. And then at the bottom, you see how we combine uh, those uh, computational fluid dynamics results with um, our camera views to understand uh, you know, what area we're focusing on and making sure we're seeing our area of most interest. So this is really exciting because um, these predictions from the CFD will hopefully be confirmed by flight observations and then validated with ground test data. So I'd like to talk about the ground testing next. Next slide. So um, here's kind of the state of the validation data as I um, described, you know, we have images and video from um, outside, uh, out the Apollo window. Um, we know that there have been effects on the landers and surrounding assets, um, you know, where we almost uh, landed um, in a, an area of a crater where we've had excavation underneath a lander um, that could cause risk to it. Um, so again, we want to understand this, but uh, there has, has not been a lot of dedicated ground testing um, to understand the phenomenon. So uh, the middle chart kind of shows you um, in thrust space, uh, the, the landing thrust. Uh, we have limited data up to about 100 pounds of thrust, and this was some uh, ground-based testing that was conducted um, by Phil Metzger and team uh, several years ago, um, but no data exists at a high thrust um, level. Um, if you look at the right, this is kind of what we're trying to fill in with our plume surface interaction project. So um, we are currently conducting a physics focused ground test or PFGT uh, in the very low thrust um, area. It is a vacuum test into regular simulant that I'll tell you a little bit more about in a minute. Um, and then later in our project, we plan to do a large scale ground test uh, with a thrust in the 5,000 pound um, range uh, with actual combustion into regular simulant. So we're hoping to fill in this, um, you know, this area where we have a little validation data. Next slide. Um, so some of the, I'm sorry, this, this chart is really crowded, but um, I'll just hit the high points here. So our physics-focused ground test objectives are to uh, look at the supersonic cratering, um, to measure crater formation, uh, and to capture visual, capture visual data um, on the growth characteristics, the behavior of ejecta, and um, to measure pressure within uh, the bed of regolith that we're firing into. We're using a very, very small supersonic gaseous uh, nitrogen nozzle, um, and we have a regolith bed that's uh, 80 centimeters by 40 centimeters by about 30 centimeters deep, and um, it has a, a plexiglass plate on one side so that we can observe the crater, and I'll show you that in a minute. Um, the second part of our testing will be done in a little bit different uh, manner without regolith, with that same nozzle firing onto an impingement plate, which you see down here in the, the bottom right. It has pressure caps in it to help us understand the behavior of that plume in the vacuum or near vacuum environment. So we are able to um, change the distance uh, the nozzle is from the regolith bed or the impingement plate. We have a range of pressures we can achieve in our vacuum chamber. We're changing the mass flow of the nozzle, and again, it's uh, a fixed temperature, uh, warm gaseous nitrogen. So next slide. Um, so here's a little bit more about our uh, soil bin, um, just to give you some pictures to look at. Uh, this soil bin was uh, designed at Kennedy Space Center by Jim Monavani and his team. Uh, as I said, we are firing into a number of different regular simulants, and so um, you can see those on the left here. We're, uh, we started with monodispersed sand and its sieve to a particular size range 
Um, we are also testing BP1, one of the higher fidelity simulants, and we're also doing monodisperse spheres. Um, so we have the whole range of very simplistic uh, simulants to try to validate our tools all a way up into very complex simulants. Um, our regolith bin here, if you look at the far right um, with the, the holes in it, you can see the sand and the plexiglass plate that I mentioned. Um, we do compact the soil with the plate, the big uh, rectangular plate that you see kind of in the middle left of the page and vibrate that plate and get uh, a uniform compaction across the regolith bed before our test um, each time we test. So next slide. Um, we have extensive diagnostics um, in the test chamber. So this is kind of how it looks. Uh, we're testing in a 15 foot vacuum chamber at Marshall's test stand 300. Um, so you see that soil bin with the, the hole pattern on the left um, and the splitter plate kind of in the middle of the screen there. And then those large circles are really, um, those are the camera cans or you know, controlled environments that we keep e each of our video cameras in. So we have uh, three cameras over uh, overhead, the FLIR cameras that you see up top there, and those produce uh, kind of a top-down image. Uh, we have a uh, camera looking at the crater formation and then two looking at the ejecta. And Johns Hopkins University uh, team is has provided all these diagnostics and they've just done a fantastic job um, giving us really great data to look at. Next slide. So here's the fun part. Um, if you could start this video, I just put a couple examples in here of different crater formations um, that uh, we're seeing um, so far. I'm not going to say too much about the test conditions or anything because all these data are still being analyzed. Um, these are hot off the press. Uh, these uh, tests are being conducted um, as we speak. So are you able to um, run the video? I hope. Here we go. All right. So um, we're looking at the splitter plate and you see how this particular crater kind of is collimated and then spreads out. Um, and then if you go to the next slide, uh, we're going to see a very different type of crater now. Um, this one, oh, I think that's the same slide. There we go. Um, this one looks a lot more annular, so you see how it erodes around the uh, circle, uh, around the outside, and then kind of uh, splashes out and uh, the middle is still filled in. So um, really, really interesting results. And I'll just show you one more picture. Um, this is uh, with our BP1 simulant, um, an example of the kind of analysis and uh, you know observation that we can do uh, with this testing. So you know here, um, our analysts have taken one of the post-test photographs and kind of labeled all of the different uh, phenomenon they're seeing in that BP1 simulant. So um, really uh, a treasure trove, I hope, of, of data for the community to use in the future. Next slide. Michelle, you have about a minute left. Okay, sure. Um, just. This is just an overview to show you kind of temporally um, that we're here with our physics focused ground test and you see a person there to kind of give you some scale. Apologies for not showing that earlier. Um, and uh, we are planning for the large scale ground test with the, the 5,000 pound combustion engine in the Plumbrook or Neil Armstrong test facility um, in late 2023. So that will uh, give us, um, you know, kind of bookend uh, the uh, two thrust classes that we're interested in, along with the uh, CLIPS instrumentation, um, which will help us fill in the scale in the middle um, to get some validation data. Next slide. So this is my last one. So, um, you know, uh, we have testing efforts that are going on that will 
provide validation data for predicting plume and ejecta environments and hopefully provide inputs to the surface excavation and construction activities. Um, and we're learning a lot of valuable lessons about vacuum testing and regular simulant use um, that hopefully will be useful to others in this community. Um, we're doing this focus, physics focused ground test now to get some very basic um, fundamental information for our tool validation. Um, and we're planning for a large scale uh, test uh, later, a uh, couple years from now. So um, hopefully this has given you a, a good idea of uh, some of the work that's ongoing that may help your community. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. This was a great presentation. We have a couple of questions on, on Q&A, but we're going to move on right now to Kathy Laurini. Um, Kathy uh, it has a, a background in electrical engineering. Um, she currently works at Dynetics in roles that include human spaceflight and uh, spaceflight strategy and human landing systems design and development. Um, she's had a, a she's had a, a career at NASA um, as well, and so she she has led 15 international space agencies in discussion and opportunities for collaboration and space exploration, including the development of global exploration roadmap. Um, so she has a vast experience in, in landing uh, systems, and so she's going to give us a great uh, presentation here. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks, Claudia. Can you hear me okay? Actually, you sound very we far away, Kathy. Very far away. Okay. Um, how about that? Is that better? Much better. Okay, great. Yeah, so um, I appreciate the chance to talk to everybody today, um, and I found Michelle's presentation um, to be excellent and fascinating, and it's a great lead into what I'm going to talk about. You know, um, you know, especially those those videos that she showed at the end. You saw the amount of regolith that's displaced um, by by rocket plumes landing, land, engines landing on the moon, and and as NASA thinks forward to building uh, Artemis Base Camp or human landing systems and the landers that will bring large cargo are going to be visiting this area. Um, you know, I would really like to see NASA aggressively pursue the availability of, of landing pads, launch and landing pads um, sooner rather than later. I mean, I, I would like to see a timeline that has them in place around 2028, about the time NASA's thinking about deploying the sustainable lunar lander. And, and, and you know, really, the, you know, you're balancing the cost of building a, a, a launch and landing pad against the cost that everybody incurs in in um, dust mitigation steps, both design and, and operational um, operational concepts, operational steps. So, you know, I, I, I have to believe if you did a cross the architecture assessment of what everybody's spending on dust mitigation capability, um, it would it would far exceed the cost of realizing a launch and landing pad. You know, I can tell you Dynetics during the Appendix H period, uh, base period, where we were one of the three companies taking a, our lander design to, to PDR, we did a lot of work on dust mitigation. And we had um, uh, did a lot of work to understand what uh, kind of steps we needed to take. And we focused mainly on the the crew and the crew health stuff. And we were just starting to understand the impacts to the maintainability of our system. You know, our sustainable lander, we're planning to um, reuse it multiple times. And so what is the impact on um, the, the mass of the dust that we accumulate on our lander? What is the impact of the, um, of the um, you know, the, the, the pitting that's, that, that Apollo um, demonstrated occurs. Um, and so all those, that impacts our, our, our maintenance strategy. So all these things we're just starting to understand and we will be working going forward. But again, that's a lot of work put into these mitigation activities that, um, that uh, could be lessened if there was a launch and landing pad constructed. So um, with that, I'm gonna talk a little bit about our um, human landing system and I'm gonna organize this in sort of three sections. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about our status. You know, we did not win one of the option A contracts as part of the Appendix H, um, uh, but I'll tell you a little bit about what how we see going forward programmatically. I'll tell you a little bit about our sustainable lander itself and then share some thoughts on um, uh, launch and landing pad realization. So, Andrew, if you could go to the next chart. So here is our a, a view of our 
lander. Um, it's a single stage, you know, it's fueled in cislunar space before it goes down to the surface. It's got that low slung crew module and it's got um, uh, solar rays, you see comm antennas, you see the ladder leading the crew down to the surface. That's the EVA door. Um, on the other side of the vehicle, you see the, um, the docking port. And we, um, it, it's roughly the same uh, uh, design that we pursued during the Appendix H. Um, but as, as I mentioned, we weren't selected. So um, NASA's updated strategy is, uh, involves uh, something called uh, Next Step BA Appendix N. And Appendix N is intended to um, uh, promote the availability of additional competition to, to SpaceX when the Lunar Exploration Transportation Services contract is, is, is let. So Appendix N is about um, you know, understanding further the, the NASA's requirements for the sustainable lander. It's about uh, advancing technologies uh, that would uh, reduce risk in being able to realize a, a sustainable human landing system or a landing system that meets the sustainable mission requirements. And, and it's about continuing your design up into the point where they can get ready for the for the Lunar Exploration Transportation System or LETS contract. So we did um, put in a, a proposal uh, in response to Appendix N. You know, we feel like our design from the beginning was sort of more focused on the sustainable mission than on getting there in 2024. Um, our design, and, and I say that because we focus on reusability from the start. We've envisioned a, a, a basic common platform that trusts around, that you see around the crew module that can carry not only the crew module as a payload, but also a large cargo element to the surface of the moon. So, so anyway, we're excited about Appendix N and um, we did put in a proposal and, uh, and I, I believe the timeline from NASA is to make some decisions in the late September timeframe and get people working early next fiscal year. So our fingers are crossed. We've got a small team that's continuing to advance the design and um, uh, look forward to that decision on NASA's part. But um, the sustainability features, the things that we've changed on the landing system to meet the sustainability requirements, um, I'll summarize briefly, you know, we had to in, enlarge the tanks a little bit because the, the um, global access requirements, so having the ability to go to multiple places on the moon is super important. Um, it, in terms of flying this lander to the Artemis Space Camp, instead of carrying two people, NASA wants to carry four, but we kind of anticipated this early in the sizing of our crew module and the consumables. So, so accommodating four isn't, isn't a problem for us. Um, surviving the lunar, lunar night requires some, some um, it has driven some trades about how do we provide the survival power that we need on the surface. So we're working those kinds of things, but um, what, and we updated our engine configuration. So we, we um, previously we had, uh, had eight smaller engines underneath and now we have four. So you'll hear more about that coming in the, in the future, but um, they're a little bit larger engines still provide the engine out capability that is um, important to ensure um, crew survivability. So we're, we're, this is a, the, not, not much really has changed um, at the big macro level with our human landing system. Um, if you go to the next page, um, so as I mentioned before, we're, we're very interested, in, you know, our, our platform, this, this, this bus, we call it Alpaca, this common platform. Um, we envision delivering um, a large cargo items like you see in the lower right, that's a, a, a rover. So we, uh, a concept for a rover. Um, we've got a, a, an ability to enlarge that volume underneath the archway to carry larger payloads. And, and if we're only making a one-way trip down to the surface, we could carry something that's that's larger and, and a lot heavier than, than the crew module would be. You know, the crew module, because we have to take it back up, you know, is limited um, in, in, in mass. And in the upper left, you see a, an, a, a vision we have for um, uh, marrying our rover design, I mean, our lander design with with the pressurized rovers that NASA envisions on the lunar surface. So um, they, they've got uh, NASA's, NASA's Artemis Base Camp vision 
calls for early deployment of, of pressurized rovers. And there's a couple of entities around the world, in fact, working on pressurized rover concepts. And um, we think with the with a docking port that you see in the front of our lander on the upper left, um, you could dock a rover to it and transfer the crew in a shirt sleeve environment. And that um, that allows NASA to leave the, the spacesuits on the surface and not um, carry them up and down, which is a, means there's more space for more space and more mass available for science and other support equipment to and from the lunar surface. So, so both the human landing system, you know, coming to a, in, in totality, a human landing system coming to an Artemis space camp, a, a lander that can deliver large cargo items. Our lander can even pick up large cargo items and take them back to the lunar surface. So let's say ultimately um, oxygen or hydrogen is produced on the surface and it makes sense to take it up to a depot in cislunar space where certain elements could benefit from it. We could take it up with this lander. So, and, and, and also the, the ops concept associated with docking a rover, all these things clearly would benefit from the existence of a landing pad. So, you know, the existence of a landing pad will simplify um, uh, many aspects of our design. It will simplify aspects of the kinds of operations like delivery of cargo, um, picking up cargo and taking it up to cislunar space. You know, this, this vision we have for a, a rover docking and transferring crew in a short sleeve environment. You can see already how these kinds of operations benefit from, from a landing pad. So um, we've been, during the Appendix H base period, we were pretty active talking to entities that we knew were, um, were uh, could envision roles um, in, in realizing a landing pad or were working on technologies associated with sintering or other critical technologies. We were very happy to support those kinds of activities by sharing the information on our landing plume and our visions and the kind of services we would like to see it at, at, a, at, a, um, at a launch and landing pad location, if you will. So one example is Exploration Architecture Core. We had a couple of discussions with, with them. They're looking to realize a, a, a landing pad on the surface of the moon. And we made it clear that if, if, if you're successful, we will be a customer, we'll be an we will be happy to be an early um, uh, anchor tenant, if you will, to help obtain funding. And I think, you know, those kinds of uh, commitments by future customers will also help um, help NASA in, in, you know, in establishing partnerships or public-private partnerships that could help realize a landing pad. So, so again, we, we talked to a number of entities that, you know, we either approached or they approached us with the openness saying, hey, you know, we'd like to see a landing pad and um, we're happy to uh, do what we can to help help its realization. And the kind of things that we would like to see on the pad are obviously, you know, the pad itself and the ability to land without um, sending a bunch of regolith everywhere, including into our lander. Um, power, obviously, if there were power available, it could provide some um, some support to our lander. During uh, during the lunar nights and other times, it would allow us to conserve resources and and power that could also be immediately provided to payloads we deliver. You know, some payloads will. Um, when we did some uh, target discussions with customers um, during the base period of Appendix H, we found that there's many want resources from us. So as soon as we put them on the surface, it would be um, helpful to have resources there available to them. You know, our lander with a low slung crew module, we think especially in a lunar gravity, it's pretty easy to put something on the surface, especially like a rover. Um, but, you know, if there were some, uh, you know, offload support or mobility equipment that was available there, it would certainly facilitate um, offloading stuff, getting it away and delivered to where it needs to go um, by, uh, by the time we depart from the landing pad. So that the, that the designer of that, uh, surface equipment won't have to design to withstand our plumes um, as we take off from the landing pad. Um, and, and this offloading, this mobility system associated with offloading could also be used to, you know, relocate things um, uh, to their final destinations on the lunar surface. So this is an example of some of the, the capabilities that we would like to see um, on, on a, at a launch and landing pad. So uh, I'll just conclude by saying, look, if, if NASA wants to take the lead, in doing this, um, that would be great. Um, 
I think there's also, because there's international interest in developing lunar surface systems, there could be some support from internationals to, to um, advance the technologies and these capabilities, the capabilities that are needed to establish a launch and landing pad and, and encourage NASA to pursue those things. Um, but if NASA doesn't want to take the lead, then I think um, a, a, there are uh, there are private entities that could be willing that would be willing to do it with the right encouragement from NASA and and anchor tenants such as ourselves. And uh, and uh, we hope that the future by by uh, by 2028 or around there um, does realize um, in a launch and landing pad on the surface. So that's what I wanted to share today, and I'm happy to take any questions that you guys might have. Thank you, Kathy. Um, so I don't see any questions right now in the Q&A, but I, I do have a question. Um, you know, for, for this vision of the landing pad serving as, as a place to, to offload things from the moon, um, what, what, do, what would you anticipate your power needs for, for such, such a capability? Well, I think it would be a fraction of what would be required to build the pad itself, frankly. So I don't see it as a driver. You know, I think, you know, certainly, you know, five, five kilowatts or so is probably enough to keep our lander happy. Uh, and a, a payload that's offloaded, um, probably less than that in terms of survival power. But again, there's going to be a lot more power needed to build the pad itself. Um, to handle all the sintering and the various moving around of, of, of the regolith. So I'm, I'm confident that whatever is put in place for those tasks will be sufficient for the ultimate users of the pad itself. So what other, um, what other uh, things would you like to see, at, you know, capabilities associated with the landing pads would you like to see in, in this vision? Uh, you know, let's imagine what kind of operations go on at the pad. If the pad is landing people, then, um, you know, you'd like to be able to um, uh, bring the, the, the rover that will take them to the base camp um, uh, as close as possible without being impacted thermally or pressure wise from the, the plumes of the landers themselves. So some sort of, you know, ability for a, a mobility pressurized land pressurized rover to, to, to wait. Um, and, and, and in our, in the case of our lander to, to pull right up and pick up the crew in a short sleeve environment. Um, and uh, so the, the crew mission um, will also be, bringing back samples, bringing back capabilities. So some ability perhaps to, to store things ready for bringing back, you know, if, if the crew's there for a month, they can stage stuff to go back at this launch and landing pad so that it's easy for them from an operational standpoint to put it back in the landers to take it with them. Um, from a cargo mission standpoint, delivering cargo down to the surface, you know, we'd like to, as I mentioned, see the ability to, um, you know, have some offloading support for somebody that might need it. I don't think that's going to be very extensive in the case of our of our lander, but because what we bring needs to be relocated anyway to the to the main habitation area of the Artemis base camp, there'll be some sort of mobility device that needs access to to with with power services probably um, to take things to tow things to the base camp or or deliver things to the base camp location. It had things like modules and and uh, and and uh, other infrastructure items that are going to be Broad. And then, you know, for the stuff, ultimately, once the resources are developed on the surface, you know, whether it's a commercial company that has resource that they want to take back, or it's a it's NASA who's developed a bunch of oxygen or hydrogen or somebody else that, you know, has something they want to take um, up to Cisner space or back to Earth um, to have an ability to stage that and then relocate that under the lander to, to be brought back up. So those are the kinds of things top level. And I'm sure as we go into each of those in more detail, there'll be some drive requirements that come from, from each of those, but that's the top level functionality that I envision. I'm gonna ask you one last question. It should be a quick one. Um, it's, uh, do you envision landing a landing pad prior to lander? <laughs> um, you know, I think it's, it's not necessary, but it would be great, you know, for us, you know, we would like to, um, 
land a demo mission and then reuse that lander itself, right? We would like to reuse it the first one we deliver. So if we can have a landing pad available, if we can, if we can know the landing pad is available from the beginning, it will save us a lot of work on dust mitigation activities that, you know, and, and a mass associated with those Dutch mit, Dutch dust mitigation. And, and, um, and so it would be great to have it before the lander, before the lander lands. I think there's some significant advantages to that. Um, is it absolutely necessary? No, but there's some significant advantages to NASA um, in that it would make our uh, lander reusability a lot more cost effective and therefore, you know, that would be a benefit to NASA and other customers. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of the, the speakers. Um, Claudia? Yes. As Mark, I just had one quick question. What about refueling capabilities at the pad? Yeah, that would also be great. You know, once, um, you know, if we could, if we could land, if we, let's say, our, you know, after a number of years when our lander is, um, uh, at capabilities have been demonstrated. You know, you could envision landing with um, less fuel in the tank and in the tanks, not not the fuel, not the fuel needed for sending off the surface, and um, and then it would be great to be able to to load that uh, at least the oxygen. I mean, our system is lacks methane, so we're probably not going to get. It doesn't make sense to get methane on the surface, but but oxygen is eighty percent of the fuel mass, right? So you could envision um, the, the the benefits of that. So yes, it would be great to have that. Absolutely great. Thank you so much, Kathy. Thank you so much to all the speakers. Um, we, we've now gone a, a two minutes over and I just wanted to thank also the, the facilitators for the breakout sessions. Um, we're gonna compile that information that we received from the breakout sessions. Um, we'll also collect the, the questions uh, and try to get them answered. Um, and, and so we will be sharing this information through our wiki um, once we have it ready for, for sharing. Um, thank you so much to everyone for participating today. This concludes the, the workshop. Thank you. Thank you all, thank, thank you. you.